Welcome back to another episode of the Southwest Climate Podcast. As always, Mike Crimmins is riding co-pilot. Hey, Zachary. How's it going? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. So this is the mid-monsoon report. I think we're a, a, a day or two past the yep. uh, the midpoint of the monsoon. And How many days th- long is the monsoon? I need a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> it's 108 days. 108 days. So we're past the midpoint. Yep, past and the midpoint. And what a first half of the monsoon it's been. Holy cow. Yeah. You know, we even had our last podcast, which technically may have been the first half of the monsoon, <laughs> already being from, I think it was about July 12th, and we were already almost 30 days in the monsoon and didn't have a lot to talk about. That's right. It's kind of been marked by three periods. We had that first part of the monsoon. Obviously, it starts June 15th, but- We give uh, it that kind of padded Yeah, we weeks. give it that buffer. Yep. Rain didn't begin really until July 10th or around that time. And my forecast was July 4th. So is there any way we can kind of revise the maps, try to put some put some rain and some rain gauges for July 4th so I can get that forecast in the books? No? No, I don't no. think we can do that. What we can do is fill up some rain gauges going forward. But and, we, we may we not did. need to do that. We may not need to do that. That's right. You're going to tell us we've got house money now. We do have a lot of house money. Okay. So uh, just to recap, the first part of the monsoon, it actually started late by historical measures, came around to the Tucson area around July 10th. We did our podcast on July 12th, so it had just started there. Um, we were talking a little bit about what a late start meant in terms of what the seasonal totals would look like. Mm-hmm. And then we basically had three solid weeks, more or less. Mother the- Nature listens to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Realize, a little behind, got to play a little catch up. And it caught up. In Tucson. We cannot oversell the wet monsoon everywhere because it hasn't been wet everywhere. That's true, but it has, for the most part, been above average. Wimby. Wet in my backyard. So let's just take a tour of some of the, the major cities here in the Southwest. If you look at Tucson right now through August 8th, we are running at 6.8 inches. Now, Mike, that is the total seasonal monsoon precipitation is somewhere around six inches. I know. So, so we're already above. Yes. We're already above the total. We've already nailed it. We did the, it. We did it, guys. We did it. We re- <laughs> achieved our goal. The pledge drives over early. We can all just, just we can relax. Just, we just no, we want, back in. But see, this is where greed comes in. Oh, okay. No, no. We're you going, just, we're we want to see what you can get. We're going to go for the record books. We'll talk about that. Okay. Um, okay. So Flagstaff's running at above average. So it's received about 5.71 inches at their airport and- at this point, more or less, they would have received about four inches. Mm-hmm. So Flagstaff's doing well. El Paso, let's go all the way to Texas. It's above average as well. It's received 4.41 inches at about this time. Historically, it would have received about two and a half, a little under two and a half. Three events of an inch or greater. And so about 80% of its total for the season has been on about three days. Okay. That's kind of what we get in the months. Yeah. Even though no, but it's not slow and steady. Let's not forget Phoenix. Okay, Phoenix is also running at above average, 1.8 inches as of August 8th. Yep. You know, and they would have at this time otherwise received a little bit over, a little bit, a little bit over one inch. Yep. And they've gotten <laughs> most, sorry, Phoenix. <laughs> well, it's, and again, the Phoenix has been kind of an interesting case. We can talk a little bit more about it at the airport. In particular, they had one rain event that put down an inch, which is half of the seasonal total. So half of their seasonal total was one day. Had it not rained up until that point, and they just got that rain event at that day, it would have been about average for the for the season. So the, it doesn't take much one it, one it event, yeah. one one large event for you to uh, sort of look like you're doing uh, better than average and and for the the airport too they've had spits they've had a lot of days where they had spits in the in their engage you know real small amounts they've they've recorded observed precip on 11 days so far in the monsoon season which is on a normal monsoon they would see about 12 or 13 for the entire season so it's been kind of interesting it's been dancing around the the outskirts of, uh, of phoenix just not hitting the airport and then if we take a tour around southeast arizona you look at the Tucson Airport, the Douglas Airport, the Nogales Airport, Sierra Vista, Oracle, Safford, Wilcox, Picacho Peak, Oregon Pipe, mm-hmm. all above average. Yeah. So what were you saying? <laughs> there has, What's your point? You're there covering? has been spatial variability, but yeah, I, there has been. I would, when, if you blur your eyes this year uh, more than any other year, I, th- I think so far it's been active. I think we can characterize it as active and uh, a, a pretty darn good monsoon for the first first half. I, I think you're showing your, your Arizona bias towards southeast, though. So the thing to think about this particular monsoon is, is that June 15th to where we are right now has, has not been even. It's had a lot of suspense 
and uh, thrillingness. Is thrillingness a word? You can make things up. Okay, that's good. Thrillingness. Up. There's there's a word though to to talk about excitement, but excitement. Excitement <laughs> is a real word, right? <laughs> Let's, we keep it simple here. <laughs> Southeast Arizona has had the frequent activity, as we would expect in the monsoon season. That little bit late of a start, hot and heavy activity across Southeast. But it's been interesting. It took Yuma weeks and weeks and weeks to get in on the action. Again, not completely unusual, but not getting the frequent activity every day. The far northwest part of the state, it took quite a while for those events to sort of reach up there. And when, when they did, they would gotten most of their rainfall in uh, parts of northwest in one or two events but they got a lot all of a sudden and all at once. Again, not terribly unusual for a monsoon season. So it's, again, you're, it's that sort of... cherry picking the, the areas that historically don't see much activity to begin yeah, with. Yeah, but we've had, we've had monsoon discussions in the past where there was a couple summers ago where we had this just stretch of the lower Colorado River that was getting these overnight convective activity like just about every night. And they just got socked in with rain. And this rain was extending all the way up into Utah. So this this has not been that particular pattern. You're, you're putting a pretty high bar on what is considered a, a good monsoon. If if Yuma and the northwest corner have to do well. Well, I'm just saying that your characterization was that everybody was winning. It's you know, I'm just trying I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to I'm just everybody trying to not, give props to our not, friends in other parts winning. of the world. There were folks in Phoenix who were waiting, 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 waiting while we were getting socked in. As it turned out with parts of Tucson, I have four inches at my house right now in, in Tucson. So the airport's got on its way to seven inches. And there are parts of Tucson from rain log and the alert network that have over 12 inches. It's right? true. And I this mean, is all about the same elevation. This is not even elevationally driven. No, it's, it, when you do zoom in on, on, on Tucson itself, there is a l- large range of, of accumulated totals so yeah. far. Let's see, sort of north central, you're around fours and, and, and fives inches. And if you go down to sort of downtown Tucson, it's like sevens and eights. Mm-hmm. Um, out in the uh, Tucson mountains to the, to the west, there's some uh, totals around 14.9 actually, yeah. some of them. That's that's believable too because this, some surrounding observations too are, are are up as high, so it's really impressive. And then the tops, if you look at the alert network, the tops of of the mountains, Mount Lemmon, I believe, is around fourteen or fifteen inches. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. Calling that off offhand, so yeah, there's and obviously you would expect that with higher elevations come more rain. But yeah, you're right, Mike. I mean, there is a, a fair amount of, of, of spatial variability here. But I'm not saying anything new, right? And so if this sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly the same discussion. <laughs> Yeah, but this, yeah. But again, I think that this year had some really interesting characteristics. Tucson, for multiple days in a row, was getting heavy rainfall coming off the mountains and intersecting different parts of the city. And we don't see that every year. Different parts of the city did better than other parts of the city. And we have that, you know, in some years a little bit better than others, but not this sort of just parade of days upon days upon days. I mean, if you remember, there was days where we were we were not seeing a ton of sun for almost two weeks. No, and the precipitable water it was, was just so... It was yeah. very, 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 very dank around, yeah. Yeah. persistently dank. You know, so, so far if in, in Tucson at the airport, there's been 17 days of, of measurable precipitation, yeah. which is uh, on the high side so far. I mean, the monsoon seasonal total is around 25. Mm-hmm. Getting to... So that's just a little bit probably ahead of schedule. If you're just sort of even, think about the even accumulation from the 15th through September 30th, we get about 25 precip days on average every monsoon season. So if you went to about halfway point, you get about 12. So we're a little ahead of schedule. But to get above the seasonal total by the halfway point, that means that most of those events are heavy events. And so that that is indeed what you see in the record is that most of these events were you know, well over a half inch um, stacking up to give you that seasonal total. So, right. So we're, we're maybe zooming in a little bit too much here on Tucson, but I do have a Yeah, figure. break it out, man. I do have People a figure People live other places. I know. I do have a figure that's worth, worth, worth highlighting. At least in this area, July was the wettest July on record. Uh, so the second wettest July turned in at 6.24 inches of rain. We had 6.8. So that's at the airport. And again, the airport isn't uh, representative completely of even the smaller yeah. Tucson, and let alone uh, the uh, this part of the Arizona and this part of the Southwest. So, but just zooming in on 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 Tucson Airport, wettest July on record. Uh, there'd only been three other Julys that produced more than six inches of rain. So, 
Um, that's pretty spectacular. And it was the second wettest calendar month on record. That's pretty good. Yeah. So so what what created that parade of thunderstorms or parade of monsoon storms? What were the conditions that set up that allowed for a pretty active period? Yeah, you know, we were kind of clicking back through the maps. And so we were sitting here on July 12th, lamenting that the monsoon had, had started late and the temps were <laughs> way up again. And uh, we were just at that point starting to see some of the moisture seep in. And so what do you need for monsoon precipitation? You need low-level moisture, right? So we needed low-level moisture to move in here. And it was just about that time, uh, right around the 9th or 10th, that we started to see the, the Gulf surge activity the sort of sloshing of that low-level moisture coming up the Gulf of California, which was largely triggered by these thunderstorm complexes that were um, moving across the mouth of the Gulf of California, which would create that pressure differential, move that moisture up into the low deserts here of, of Arizona. And once we had that in place, you know, we were then relying on the dynamics of every day of whether or not we just had the winds coming in the right direction to be able to move the storms off the mountains or not, and then see how the convection would set up. But it seemed like Whereas I don't remember last monsoon seasons in the past being a sort of persistent in terms yeah. of the storms. Yeah, and that, that's the interesting thing is when you go back and look at the, just for example, we would look at the 500 millibar geopotential height maps. So just looking at the, that level in the atmosphere, which is about 15, 20,000 feet this time of year, uh, looking at the wind direction in that particular. So it's a large scale flow pattern around there. And so what you're looking for is, and that's really what we're looking for in the monsoon season as a reversal, is that circulation pattern is clockwise around a high pressure system. And so that is what we're looking for with the monsoon ridge. And that monsoon ridge at the beginning of the season is uh, south of us, that mm -hmm. high pressure system at mid-levels of the atmosphere. And the flow is out of the southwest on the northern side of that ridge, right? So if you're in southwest flow, you're going to typically be in a dry regime. And it's going to tell you a lot of other um, conditions about the atmosphere at the same time that it's not favorable for monsoon activity. So we did see the monsoon ridge um, north of us. We didn't quite have the moisture. So we had the winds out of the east um, at the upper levels. And the moisture was now starting to move up the Gulf of California into the southern um, parts of Arizona. Those ingredients came together. But then for the, the rest of the month, it was a very flat, kind of amorphous ridge across much of the United States. And looking at the map, it was very, very weak flow out of the east all the way across um, southern Arizona, southern New Mexico, Texas, all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. And as you went further north, it shifted back around to the west. So there's this very, very long fetch of easterly, weak, very, very weak easterly flow from the Gulf of Mexico to us. And so that, in association of that low-level moisture, we would have these little distur upper level disturbances come along. And that was just enough to create a little bit of wind shear, a little bit of change in the direction of the wind's upper levels, that coupling with the level of a moisture, the daily cycle of convection, just set us up for this very persistent pattern. Y you know, you look at the weather map and there's the way that some of them were plotted, that there's so little difference in these heights it was very hard to determine even what was going on in the maps. I mean, in a way, I, I almost think that that would sort of be ingredients for not a persistent monsoon. I agree. And that, that was why it was it was just such an even open playing field that the little wiggles in the upper levels of the atmosphere and these little disturbances, it was interesting to watch, is that the jet stream was very far north. It was a very kind of stagnant summer pattern across much of the United States, much of the kind of the United States is that there'd be little weak cold fronts that would come through the upper Midwest and maybe make it down into the Southeast. And you can think about that big, large ridge of high pressure is that the little um, leftover remnants of these cold fronts and little storm systems would sag into Florida. And then they would get caught on the, the bottom part of the ridge and then pulled and across moved west. Yeah. Yeah. And they would move west. And so you'd get these, you could, you could actually track back and see these little vorticity signatures, these little swirls in the atmosphere, which will can later create a little bit of wind shear, can create a little bit of lift in the atmosphere, can create a little bit of uh, instability, depending on how they are sort of Do they of bring up. moisture with them? Not necessarily. Depends on where they're coming from. So it's, it's just, it's, it's helping to create yeah. atmospheric instability. Yeah, we, weren't, we weren't lacking for moisture. A lot of us are reading Mike Luthold's uh, Arizona Wurf blog, and he was noting by the sort of third week of July that he couldn't remember a moisture surge lasting for that long. And then it kept going. It went on for like two more weeks. He was saying, this has got to be some kind of record. And we don't have real good climatologies of precipitable water, but 
when you're looking at some of the analyses, they were, you know, two, three standard deviations above average, just persistently, no breaks, just the moisture is in place, the wiggles were coming by. It was just it was really good for firing off convection, especially for for Tucson and these areas that were close to the mountains. It was tougher for the lower desert areas. We had it took a while for those big organized convection convective events that formed on the mountains to move out into the low deserts. And we only had a handful of those actually in the last couple of weeks as well. Yeah, I mean if you look at like the dew point temperature, at least here in this 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 part of the state, I mean, they were persistently above 60 degrees Fahrenheit from, you know, July 11th all the way just until the last couple of days. Yeah. I mean, it was just So the last couple of days was our first real uh, dry out. Yeah. Monsoon yeah. break. Yeah. You know, bursts and breaks are a known phenomenon in the historical climatology of the monsoon. And the research is, there's not real good rhyme or reason to uh, when and why they necessarily occur, even how often you'd expect them. But this was a, that was a really good, long, socked-in stretch of having low-level moisture in, in southern Arizona, for sure. You know, I've heard a lot about these inverted troughs this, this year, more than I have in past years. I mean, I think this is what you're talking about. These yeah. Sort of wiggles in the in the upper level level flow as they they pass on on, on the easterlies. They're, they help generate the sort of dynamic instability with the the moisture already present sort of fuels up these these convective storms that happen. Yeah, depending on their strength and their trajectory and their origination and their levels in the atmosphere, like where they're occurring and where they're strongest can have different favorable aspects to them. It, it seemed to be in sort of reading a lot of the discussions that it was they would come by and they would enhance the shear. So they would create enough directional and speed variability um, as you went up in the atmosphere to be able to organize storms and move them off of mountains, right? And that that's really the critical thing here in the Southwest is that it's not hard to make it rain if you've got topography, right? So topography drives the convection. But if you want to organize the storms and not have them sort of be killed by their own, the updraft being squelched by its own downdraft as it gets too heavy, you need to have a little bit of shear to sort of organize the storm to be able to move forward and to take advantage of having the outflows out ahead of them. So they've got to have some speed and direction, directional shear to be able to organize them. And then you really need to have that in a much bigger organized fashion to move them out to the low desert because the low desert doesn't have any of those mechanisms to, to focus that convection other than the whole movement of the outflow boundaries and be able to scoop up that air and drive that convection. So, so Phoenix actually... If you're looking at, you know, we're watching the forecast discussions in the summer, the parts of July, they were kind of on the edge of being able to just go explode with good thunderstorm activity, but they just didn't have the triggers. Tucson, on the other hand, is nestled in this valley with mountains right by, so it's much easier to get an outflow to roll off of a mountain and then pop up some convection. So given that thermodynamic environment, we're just, you know, it's, it's better to be closer to a mountain or on a mountain, really. So the other thing that I, I thought was interesting, that there were a number of days where you had this anvil shading, like the conditions were, the moisture was there, there was dynamic instability, but yet you had the tops of the, the clouds that would be blown over and, and really shade the, the lower deserts and prevent heating and, and, and convection there. You know, you were talking about the, the wind shear. How does that relate to the... So that's that's part of the, what you want to have is good directional shear, depending on where you're at. If the 200 millibar flower, so you're getting up to... Again, there's not there's not really a jet stream at this time of year because it's it's the height field's very flat. So we don't really have much speed as you go up in the atmosphere. It's just a very weak flow pattern. But if you can get that 30,000, 40,000 foot flow to go, be going from the southwest to the northeast and you're in an easterly flow, you're going to blow the anvils off to the northeast uh, away from where you're going to have the storms propagate, mm. right? So you, you want the storms to propagate into sunny right. conditions because that's going to maintain that instability. If you have completely unidirectional wind and it's increasing with height or it's it's not, you want it kind of fast. Increasing at, in intensity? Yeah, increasing okay. in speed. If it's really quick at that level, you're going to get convection to blow up on the mountains, and then you're going to get an anvil that just shoots out ahead of it. And Which will shade. It, yeah, and again, if the instability is marginal, that little bit of shading could knock the temps down at the surface. And then if the outflow is not enough to sort of kick it above and overcome that instability, then it's going to kind of nuke your chances there. So it's, it's, it's just amazing to me that thunderstorms propagate at all in the monsoon season. And so that's why it's easy to make it rain in the mountains. It's hard to do it everywhere else. And it's you got to have all these things in, in right play. So anvil shading has been, at least in Tucson, not been too much of an issue 
just because of the the just little nuances in the everyday flow and where the very weak 500 millibar field would wander around and then where the height field above that at 200 millibars would sort of wander around and, and how that directional shift in wind and speed would change. It just kind of worked out that Tucson was able to, to really do well. Other parts of the state caught up in big ways really quickly with very intense rainfall events, but didn't necessarily have the frequency that we would have seen here in uh, Tucson proper. We didn't even talk about New Mexico. Where's that? <laughs> <laughs> Albuquerque proper has had a, a a pretty slow monsoon so far as, as to what you'd expect and see their ramp up with precip to but, this point in, in the season. You know, just looking at the, the big picture here of, of New Mexico, there is a number of its regions have experienced pretty wet conditions. You know, and I think it's, it's, it probably is this, um, Again, nature, spatial variability nature. I think Albuquerque hasn't been quite as lucky as some of the other places, but I do know that I was hearing that southwest New Mexico just had an epic week or two with picking up rainfall. The mountains have done well. I think it picked up a lot. And then the plains on the east side have picked up some activity as well. But it seems like some of the valley locations in between uh, along the Rio Grande haven't done quite as well. Well, just in comparis- comparing in yeah. New Mexico and Arizona – about fifty percent of New Mexico is experienced above average. Above I don't know. Average. I I must be off by a year or two yeah. with my whole monsoon characterization because I, now I'm looking at all the data and I think there's such a quick catch up um, with a lot of locations even in the last week of July mm-hmm. that I'm probably like still operating off of July twentieth um, <laughs> data in my brain. But if you look at and you look at Arizona, Arizona is about. F- Less than slightly less than forty percent of its areas is about yeah above average above average and by above average, actually here we mean yeah it's one hundred and twenty five percent pretty generous or above the, yeah so on, on sort of average. much above that's just to say that in aggregate uh, New Mexico is is you know since June fifteenth has been uh, spatially wetter than. Arizona. Yeah, I do think that the Albuquerque observation looks like a bit of bad luck because it looks like it has been raining everywhere in the state pretty persistently since the end of June. A couple of big days uh, southeast New Mexico on July 31st, a big event there and across much of southern New Mexico there. Yeah, parts of uh, southwest New Mexico picking up really persistent good activity. And, you know, hearing reports from southeast Arizona, southeast Arizona actually had sort of a similar situation is that while Tucson was getting socked in in sort of mid-July, uh, far southeast in the Chiricahuas really hadn't seen much until basically the last week of the month. And then boom, they were catching, you know, four-inch rain events with um, some of the, you know, afternoon and overnight convection there. So big push towards the end of the month. It'll be interesting now seeing that some of these locations are now matching their full seasonal totals. Where do we end up? Going right. forward. So I started this by saying that the monsoon so far has had these three periods. Like the first period was dry, has late start. Then we had this protracted period of activity. You, yep. you corrected me by saying not every place is one, but you know. I think but then you corrected me because I'm looking at all the data and I'm saying it's that's, not bad that's pretty true. much anywhere. You know, I, was, I like how you like, think in real time on the, you know, you change your mind in real time. It's like you I'm, see the evolution of Mike. I'm a total flip flopper. Yeah. I, uh, yes. I'll, but, I'll, but then, you know, in the last week, actually, we've taken a nosedive. Like the, the mon- nosedive. It's mon- a break. I re- it's just. Just chill out, man. Okay, fine. So it's a, it's, it's a little bit hyperbolic there, but no. I mean, we, we we're in a monsoon break, but it's a break. Yeah, but and, and they that, happen. They yeah. do. Breaks happen. happen, man. That's what my bumper sticker says. Monsoon season isn't over. We're just taking a break. That is important to note, but also there's no guarantee that the the monsoon will continue the way it's been prior to this break. You told me you didn't care. You said house money. No, we've already nailed the seasonal total. It could not rain again. I I think that's just no, no, no. That's, that's actually not what I said. I said I want to be greedy. I, I, we oh, want to go for right. the record. The Tucson plot looks ridiculous. It really does. The the cumulative preset plot. Look at all that cramming going on there. Like, and now it's basically wants to coast, coast into the finish here with September thirtieth. So, Mike, if you look at so August, so July in Tucson, you know, on average gets two and a quarter inches. Okay. August gets 2.4 inches Mm -hmm. and September gets about 1.3. So August actually historically is our wettest month. Is the wettest month. That being said, the three, three of the four wettest monsoon months have been in July. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. That is interesting. Yeah. 
so okay, so if we we were to run this out here, you know, we just get average in August, we get 2.4 in August, we get 1.3 in September. That's going to combine with the 6.8 in in July, and uh-huh. you know, we're going to be top 10 monsoon if we just produce average. Okay, what do you think the chances are of nailing average going forward? Exact average zero. <laughs> what do you think of even coming coming close? Coming close to average. <laughs> That's the fallacy of average. <laughs> I know. I, I I agree. I agree. I love the idea that we would coast in. One of the analogs that's been pulled up on some of our monsoon plots here has been 2007. So 2007, to me, it looks it looks really. So again, this is just Tucson. We can kind of do this exercise for different places. 2007 was interesting and had a very similar pattern with monsoon activity didn't start until after July 15th in Tucson proper. So June 15th to July 15th, no recorded precip. And then between July 15th and August 1st, Tucson got over five inches of precip. I don't know what it is on the records there for, for Tucson as how, for, as how that ranks, but that's what that's twice the average precip. So the remaining precip that occurred from August 1st through September 30th, so that's another... 60 days of monsoon activity was less than an inch and a half. That is a possibility. That's a very pessimistic way of looking at it. But as far as an analog, there was still rain events, but they were, as far as the airport tracking them, they were very small events. And so the overall number of days with rain in 2007 was about 22. So it'd be another handful of events going forward for us, again, thinking of this, and the, the total seasonal total was 6.58, so a little bit less than what we have right now. That's on probably worst-case scenario. Right. We would have a bunch of events that sort of dribble in for the airport. Again, I don't know what this says about the rest of the, the Tucson metro area, let alone the state at this point, without doing that exercise well, a little be, bit more spatially. It would be highly unlikely for us to reach the record, which is close to 14 inches in Tucson. What year was that? That was 1964. 2006, we had 10.2 inches. That's the most recent. 2011, we had 8.62. It's interesting. If you look at 1964, again, for Tucson, was kind of a, uh, it was a, a fairly decent. A couple of big events in July and then right around August 1st. And then um, a fairly frequent number of events, probably a quarter to a half inch through the rest of August. And then an over three inch event in September is really what lofted that into the record books. And so that's most likely something tropical. So going forward, I think the tropics really become the game changer. Yeah, for September the rest can of really the, yeah. change change the totals. The second wettest monsoon is 1955. Was there a, some boost from September there? No, it's interesting. So 1955 for Tucson was, it's got, I count. That actually could be an That's an interesting, interesting analog, analog as well. It looks like it really stopped raining the end of August, and there wasn't much measurable precip in September at all. So the, the record came at the end of August. So September was almost completely dry for the last 30 days. All of that precip came. This is really an interesting month because it had no June precip, very little precip before July 15th. All of that 13 inches happened between July 15th, September 1st. And there are, mm-hmm. I count, four events above an inch and three above two to get to that total. So, and it had 25 precip events. Uh, so it nailed the long-term average, but produced twice the precip. Twi- these events were twice as heavy as, as uh, from a daily perspective as normal. It's equally likely that August and September you know, sort of keep up this high activity and we end up in, you know, a top five or, or top, Ooh, this is, wait, we're in wager territory yeah, now. Top, I, I like this. I like, where are you well, going with so, this? Well, so, okay. So like I said before, for Tucson, if we just do average in August and, and September, we're going to come in at the eighth wettest monsoon. Okay. That's just doing 2.4 inches in August, which is a, you know, it could be like three events. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Four Easy. events. You could do that. And then conceivably it, and in then one, September right. is one point three, which can, can be one remnant tropical storm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And people should note that the the forecast for the East Pacific tropical activity is near average. So yeah. there's, there's not an indication that it will be a, a 
above average storms this year, but, but there could be. But well, Right. And it doesn't even have to be above average. All it has to do is, and again, we're not talking about, it's typically not a, a frequency issue. It's about steering the storm into the right spot at the right time. And so climatologically, as we get into August and into September, we start to see the larger scale synoptic pattern with a little bit better steering of sort of moving stuff in from the south. True, but more storms in September Absolutely. would increase our chances of one of those yeah. recurving into yep. our area. Yeah, and, yep. and they're dicey. That... I mean, we we have seen over the last couple of years where we've gotten the Odeals or the Norberts producing those widespread precip events in early September. It's so hard to forecast on a seasonal. I mean, you really can't. We, them becoming a player, climatologically, we're going to be moving into that window. Whether or not that actually happens is completely different. Well, thing. and we're, we're recording this prior to what looks to be like another surge episode later this week in yeah, five days yeah. or so. There's, you know, a, there's a, a, a passing decaying tropical storm, Franklin. The monsoon looks like that break potentially could be over in the next three or four days as the, the moisture surge so I, makes this, its way into I'm not, Arizona. Okay. The last couple of years, we've typically had them forming off the southern coast of Mexico and then kind of moving off to the northwest and triggering events off the Gulf of California. This is one actually moving from the Gulf of Mexico across and then triggering. I mean, again, not uncommon, but it, it feels a little different because we're seeing less of that activity in formation south and then moving into favorable locations of the Gulf of California than we had had in the last couple of summers. Things have definitely sort of shifted around a little bit. So yeah. And again, this break is about what you expect, probably a week long. And then if we pick, buck, pick back up in activity, it does not look like a total shut down in monsoon activity for the rest of the month. But, you know, again, take it week by week. All right. So back to your wager. Let's say the wager is, will the Tucson airport receive more than 10 inches? Nope. You taking it? I'm going to take it. All right. That's good. Be- oh, man, you know what? I'm I'm betting in, in with less likely, with lower, lower probabilities. Yeah, here. so it seems like your payout's got to be more. Yeah. So, okay. So if you win, I give you a coffee. If I win, you give me a six pack. Of coffee? Of beer. Oh. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yep. All right, it's on. All right, yeah. Uh, that sounds good. All right, let's just make this monsoon a little bit more interesting. I think so. So how do you think the rest of the state will fare, though? I think that that's sort of interesting because not everybody's had a screaming deal so far this season. So but I don't want to leave everybody if, else if out. If Tucson experiences, if the airport experiences an above average rest of the monsoon, then generally speaking, the rest of the monsoon region will experience above average. What do you think of that? No. I think it's a bellwether. You think so? I think we can find instances of both. Well, right. But what, fair enough. But what would be a bellwether then? Or or, or is is the concept meaningless in the monsoon? I think it's meaningless in the monsoon. Yeah. I mean, you go back. I kind of agree with you on that. uh, Yeah. You can go back and you can look, you can find every, at least looking through our data, it seems like you can find every possible flavor. And it doesn't seem like the correlations necessarily hang together. Spatially, like if one goes one way, it tells you something about some other place. You have to be really close. Maybe upper elevations in general all go together. Um, once you get down to lower elevations and further away from the mountains, I think it really does fall apart. We're at the halfway point, so there's a lot of monsoon left, and that's the kind of exciting part. But looking I, forward. But even though I took the minority position, it is worth pointing out that the probably the likeliest condition is is around nine inches. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, you you picked a little bit too high for your. Uh, I'm, your I'm banking on. I'm banking You're on this. Ten. You're gonna have to have one to push you over the edge. There's gonna be like one pop up thunderstorm over the airport that floods out, floods Valencia. I hear about it, drowns the rain gauge in two inches, <laughs> and then the rest of the city has suffered epic drought for the rest of the season. So that's just how that's how this thing works. I know uh, this works. All right. Well, that was a fairly deep dive into the statistics of, of the monsoon so far. Yeah. So, Mike, um, any final parting shots on the monsoon? What, do, what did we miss? We didn't talk that much about temperature, but we can come back next <clears throat> month at the end, at mid, mid-September and sort of look at the whole, whole season and, 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 put, uh, and put temperature and precipitation in the, in the context of the entire season. That'll be interesting to kind of go back and look at because some of the plots for July – Temperatures actually show that there were near average to below average locations that were getting socked in with clouds and rain every day. So that's what it takes to actually get a near average to below average temperature is it has to be cloudy every day here <laughs> during right. the summertime. And, and, so. and what the monsoon is going to do going forward is largely going to determine how temperature plays out. Yeah. Like yeah. the first part, 
when the monsoon wasn't around, we ha- we were had very high temperatures, yep. record setting for, for for some days. Absolutely, monsoon came in, kind of knocked it back. Precip, yeah, yeah knock, knocked it down. Yeah. So and the, know, the temperature the, remains to be seen. Right, and the temperature plots that you know we look at now, there are much of uh, central and northern Arizona for July was above average. It kind of tells a story that they on most days were not getting precip and were in kind of full sun, and then their totals became with those kind of few and far between events, whereas Southern Arizona was getting socked in every day. Frequency mattered, keeping that solar radiation down. And you can even see that if you look at some of the solar radiation plots on how noisy the plots were, when typically we'll have these days where there's no clouds and you just get a nice sharp curve. And these were all noisy because the clouds were kind of drifting by. So this break right now, it's going to temperatures are popping back up or way above average again. So the more breaks you have in the season, typically the higher the temperatures are that you're going to see for right now. So August will probably tell the story is, do we get socked in again with another big run of frequent events or do we do this sort of every couple days? Uh, it's really going to help. Definitely for a number of weeks there, a pretty fantastic Absolutely. monsoon season. Didn't really see it coming. You never do. And that was that was pretty cool. Pretty cool to have it turn out that way. I hope it keeps up. Me too. Thanks everybody for listening. And we'll come back, do a, a, a monsoon recap sometime in, in the middle of September. Yep. We'll see everybody. Thanks for tuning in. The Southwest Climate Podcast is a production of Clemus, which is part of NOAA's Regional Integrated Science and Assessment Program and is housed at the University of Arizona Institute of the Environment. Mike Crimmins is a principal investigator with Clemus, a professor of soil, water, and environmental science in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and climate extension specialist with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Zach Guido is a research scientist with the Institute of the Environment and UA program manager of the International Research and Applications Program. The podcast is edited and produced by Ben McMahon, research outreach and assessment specialist with Clemus. At that point, uh, I think I'll collect on, uh, on my oh, wager your with wager. you. your wager. That's right. You'll have to tell me what kind of six-pack. <laughs> <laughs> thinking of uh, Fanta Orange. Is that, what, is that what you were thinking? I was thinking more like wine coolers. Oh, uh, wine coolers. Fantastic. Zima. All right, uh, you're on.